welcome to our special Asian in Wisconsin, battling bias in the Badger State. This past year has been filled with a lot of pain and heartbreak for the AAPI community, but we've also seen so much resilience, strength, and compassion. In the next hour, you'll hear from local business owners hoping to bridge the racial divide with some food for thought. An area actor giving back and helping kids in the AAPI community know their self-worth and build self-confidence. You'll also hear from our panel of local leaders offering insight on the issues here at home and their hopes for change in the future. But before we get started, let's take a look back at how we got here. We knew it was coming. I feel there's kind of like a lot of hatred that towards Asia. Taking social distancing to an outrageous extreme just to move away from you, but not anyone else. What are you doing in this country? Why hey, doesn't stop. she go back to where she came oh from? My God. <laughs> Everything from racial slurs to people spray painting stuff on our, our driveway. Oh, it's those Chinese people again. I knew who was referring to me. Go back to wherever you come from. The and chicken, all these things, we got all of them. This is not new. No, it's not. Well, the first were probably Chinese. Around the 1848 gold rush, there was hostility towards that for the longest time. There were riots essentially after Pearl Harbor, Japanese Americans. They were viewed as enemy aliens. Kung flu, China virus, the China plague. When you have the president, you know, making those kinds of statements, I do think that made it worse. Again, it gave people permission to behave in certain ways because they felt that it was condoned. It's kind of like that match that ignites this powder keg that has recently begun to explode. While the recent attacks happening in other parts of the country have made national headlines, they are very real for people here in Southeast Wisconsin. For more insight, we turn now to our panel, their local leaders in health, business, and our local government. Pradeep Kalika is one of the co-chairs for the AAPI Coalition of Wisconsin. Minds at Tao, Sherry Tran, Eric Kennedy, they are the founders of the local Elevation APA Collection. The group works to highlight and support people and businesses of the AAPI community. I want to take you back to March of 2020 when the FBI released a report warning of an increase in hate crimes against Asians as COVID spread. At that time, the nonprofit Stop AAPI Hate started recording anti-Asian attacks happening around the country. And around that time, the AAPI Coalition of Wisconsin was formed. Pardeep, you're one of the co-chairs. So can you tell us a little bit about the group and what you have found in this past year? The last year of the pandemic happening, we uh, heard reports, we saw reports, and uh, we were just concerned for the, uh, the growing number of racialized violence directed towards the AAPI community and wanted to have a uh, relationship with local leaders uh, within the business community as well as um, federal, state, local law enforcement um, and just bring, bring to them the concerns that we were having, we were hearing. Mm -hmm. And many people out there, I think they'd be surprised or have been surprised to learn that these attacks on Asian Americans are happening across the country. This is nothing new. So I want to go around to each one of you just a little bit about your experience with anti-Asian hate. Sherry, let's start with you. I think you'll talk to any Asian you know, American today and they'll say they had some form of bullying experience uh, as a child. But as we get older, I think that bullying still exists, but it changes in shape. It becomes more microaggressions that we may see. And my dad was a welder. So he would come home and he had this trench coat right, that was just filled with grease, and he would always hang it outside uh, our door um, and then come inside the house. And one evening, somebody came into our backyard uh, and set my dad's jacket on fire. And then I remember being in parking lots at the grocery store with my family, you know, and us kids would probably be in the car while my dad ran an errand, um, and people would walk by our car and spit on our window windshield. And this is in the early 80s when there was, you know, the huge first wave of Hmong refugees to this country. We went to catch up with some friends and, and someone told me I wasn't, I wasn't uh, welcome there because of who I was. And they thought I was Hmong and they said some inappropriate words. So I think that it's just a reflection on how far we, we have come in, in certain ways, but how far we have not moved forward as a community. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Eric, Sherry, Mainza, all of you started the group Elevation, the APA Collective, about, what is it, five years ago now. It's a way to support and elevate the visibility and success of the Asian community here locally. I, I, I want to turn to Sherry. How important is that visibility during this past year, especially with COVID, for Asian Americans? So when it comes to businesses that have been suffering during the pandemic, we, we take it upon ourselves to help tell their stories like like you know Pardeep said to elevate those stories bring more of a platform to these organizations and businesses and people that may not have a strong platform of their own it's not only us using our own personal network and our relationships but also the relationships that we built throughout the community to say what can we do for the asian and aapi community during this time the restaurant industry nationwide has suffered tremendously during this pandemic, but Asian-owned restaurants are being hit especially hard with the added fear of race-related attacks. That's especially true for Lucky Lou's in Milwaukee. The restaurant shut down completely for nearly two months, posting to Facebook that some of the restaurant's employees experienced xenophobic and verbal attacks at the start of this pandemic. Well, even with that fear, many local Asian-owned restaurants are choosing to bridge the gap of differences through the power of food. At Meat on the Street in Milwaukee. Food is just a way of showing love. Food can do so much more than satisfy a hungry appetite. Even if we can't communicate, we'll still be able to eat and share a meal together, and I think that that is really special. And the actual kitchen. Oh, the kitchen's coming along? Yeah, we finally got the hood in. And that's the sentiment that's also echoed by SapSap Sap and Racine. To learn about other cultures, to break down walls, to break down stereotypes. For owners Alex Hanasata and Alexa Alfaro, sharing food from their Asian heritage is power for change. How powerful is food? It's, it's super powerful. Sap Sap opened in 2015, meet on the street a year earlier, and business for Alexa had been growing ever since until the pandemic hit. Catering sales were extremely down because mass gatherings is how we make money in our industry. Sap Sap has been weathering the pandemic with just its carryout in preparation of opening its brick and mortar shop of Southeast Asian cuisine this spring at the Old Toteros in Mount Pleasant. So this is kind of like the seating area slash pickup. Yep. Both have worked during this pandemic to feed frontline healthcare workers and give away free meals to people in need. And I think it's important. But for more than a year, Alex says his worries haven't just been about staying in business. Me walking around alone and even seeing people see us play with food or touch food, you know, the thought was always in the back of my head, like, what, what are they thinking? This heightened awareness comes as anti-Asian attacks have risen across the country during the pandemic. But to Alex, it's nothing new. Everything from racial slurs to people spray painting stuff on our, our driveway. Did you tell anyone? Like police? That's funny you say police because um, one time we got pulled over and my father, he couldn't speak the language. This officer is like getting nervous himself. And eventually the officer pulled out a gun, told us to get on the floor. He searched the car, he searched me and my dad. And, and being such a young kid, seeing this was really traumatizing. It's real for us too. For Alexa, seeing other AAPI businesses around her struggle because of anti-Asian hate is tough. Our favorite local mom and pop grocery stores closed because they're like, we just don't feel safe to stay open. We have people come in that harass us. It's happening right here in Wisconsin. Macy Hur is the executive director of the Hmong Chamber of Commerce. She says while Asian owned businesses have done their best to overcome hate as well as a pandemic, some in southeast Wisconsin just haven't been able to survive. Before you know it, they've closed. And that seems unusual to me to not hear about them. For our beer patio, we were hoping just to open that up and people just order their food. But for Alex and Alexa, there's always hope for change. And it starts with some food for thought. Meet on the street, how can I help you? Growing up, seeing my parents use that as a tool to conversate with neighbors, kind of really opening up the gap between language and, and culture. Political, economical, social view, whatever it may be, we disagree on everything. But if you put food in front of us, and if we're hungry enough, we'll eat. The nonprofit Stop AAPI Hate has recorded more than 6,600 instances of anti Asian attacks from March of 2020 to March of 2021, but that number is grossly underreported. Many in the AAPI community say it's things like language barriers, fear of retaliation, or fear of police, maybe immigration issues that keeps them from saying anything. Well, here in Wisconsin, a hate crime 
charges are few and far in between. In Wisconsin, a hate crime constitutes as any traditional criminal offense motivated by hate or bias. Wisconsin has four laws that protects people and property targeted based on race, religion, color, disability, sexual orientation, national origin, or ancestry. And what's noticeably missing in the state's hate crime statute is our transgender community. The nature of a hate crime itself can make it hard to prove in court, so we sat down with Milwaukee attorney Edgar Lynn to learn why and what needs to change. It requires an additional layer of motive because the hate crime itself is not a crime. Hate crime is an enhancer to pre-existing crime. So there has to be a verbal and a physical component to Correct. it in order for it to be a hate crime. Correct, because there is the protection of the First Amendment. You can have many hate speech are also protected. So what change needs to happen? One thing that Wisconsin doesn't have is mandatory reporting of hate crimes. The federal um, government has that. Wisconsin does not, so it's all voluntary. So mandatory data collection will be very helpful, right? Because we can see where the hot spots are, where the problems are, and where funding should go into, right? The other part is training for law enforcement. How to investigate these cases will definitely be helpful. Well, President Joe Biden signed the COVID Hate Crimes Act into law last week. It's in an effort to counter the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes. In the past few months, several communities in the state have also passed resolutions condemning anti-Asian attacks. That includes Wauwatosa. And after a second try, West Dallas's only Asian-American older person, Angelito Tenorio, was also able to pass one. Last November, Wisconsin elected its first Asian-American representative to serve in the state legislature. Well, ever since she took office in January, Francesca Hong has worked tirelessly to create a more equal tomorrow for everyone. Here's Sharon Bagenda. Being an Asian-American woman in the state legislature right now has immense challenges, but it also is incredibly gratifying. Growing up in Madison, Representative Francesca Hong struggled with a sense of belonging as a Korean American. This is paddle boating in Door County. Hong says there was always a part of her that felt she didn't fit in. Assimilation oftentimes means negating a lot of the culture that I wanted to be more proud of, but I felt pressure that I couldn't always celebrate uh, the culture and heritage that um, I had in my home. Sister, me, mom, and my grandma. As an Asian American in Wisconsin, Hong says she's experienced ignorance and racism. I've had comments about my driving, about my looks. I've been called, you know, a ch I've been pulled by my hair. <laughs> it, these things happen and it's, it's different. Racism has so many different forms. While growing up wasn't always easy, her parents allowed her to explore different yeah, interests and one space did give her that sense of belonging. That motion, I did that for three years. The kitchen. Working with my hands always made me really happy. And um, food was always so central to community that it just kind of naturally fit together for me. And passing that sense of belonging was important to Hong. She opened up Morris Ramen in Madison's Capitol Square. Not only belong there, but that, you know, it's a little sense of home for them. Um, and we always want to do food that, that reaches people's souls. From Capitol Square into the Capitol itself, Hong's desire is to represent a community of diverse backgrounds. I'm more certain that the Capitol doesn't belong to anyone, that it belongs to the people. Her Asian American constituents have expressed how difficult it is to talk about the microaggressions they've experienced in everyday life, and she hopes to change that. What I want folks to recognize is that Asian Americans don't always have the spaces or the avenues to talk about it, as well as articulate that it's, you know, it's happening to us. This is not okay. She's making her presence known in the Capitol to stand up for Asian Americans. Representative Hong has introduced a resolution condemning violence against the Asian Pacific Islander Desi American community following the March shootings in Atlanta killing eight people, six of whom were Asian women. The resolution received support from the Democratic caucus but did not garner bipartisan support. But it's not stopping the new representative. Anti-Asian hate is not um, new. We know that it has been occurring for many, many years, but it is just now, unfortunately, took tragedy for us to have larger conversations around racial injustice. On May 11th, Representative Hong successfully passed a different resolution on making May APATA Heritage Month with the support of some Republican colleagues. The history of, of how our diaspora and, and the Asian communities in Wisconsin and in the country are incredibly unique and diverse. She's also working on the Economic Justice Bill of Rights. To ensure these rights are 
accessible to every single Wisconsinite. The, the right to clean water, the right to housing, the right to affordable health care, um, education, and to live free from discrimination. As Hong prepares to continue the battle in creating a stronger community, her one piece of advice to the Asian American community is this, be seen. To the Asian American community, I say lead unapologetically. We need uh, leaders from our communities to really set forth and take up spaces that we are not often seen in. News of the mass shooting in Georgia last March sent shockwaves through the AAPI community. The shooter has been indicted with murder charges and could be facing hate crime charges as well. But some still wonder if this tragedy really had anything to do with race. We asked that question to our panel. So once again, here's Mainza Tao, Eric Kennedy, Pardeep Kalika, and Sherry Tran. I, I want to know what your initial reaction was when you first heard this happen. Mainza? Um, I think it was shock, Colleen. We knew it was coming, but I think when it actually happened, it was, and it was right, it was a compilation of different incidents and tragedies that finally led up to the shooting throughout the nation. But it was shock, and then it was, how do we move forward, at least locally and here in Wisconsin? How do we, as a collective, how do we now move forward and help protect our community here? There are people out there who say the shooter confessed it was a sex addiction, that while six Asian women were killed, two were not of Asian descent. But for so many in our community, it's hard to separate race from this tragedy. Sherry, why is that? You know, it's it's unfortunate that, that people, you know, try to, to rationalize or do like the mental gymnastics necessary to try to, you know, not claim it as, as a hate crime just because like two of the uh, individuals that weren't targeted, but it wasn't about targeting people, it was targeting the businesses and what those businesses represented to this shooter, right? He had a perception in his mind that he was ridding the world of some kind of a temptation that, uh, that bothered him. And so he associated these businesses with you know, uh, you know, the sex industry or whatever his temptations or issues were. And that is an unfair generalization and stereotype about these businesses. Mainza, I want to go to you as well. I, there are also people out there who say, you know, these women, they didn't have to work there. If they didn't like it, they could just leave. Is that, uh, but this has such a, a long standing history in Asian culture. Mm -hmm. It does, you know, I, people, there are certain people, right? Life circumstances in which you have, you do what you need to do to survive, whether it's for you individually or for your family. So that's a whole separate issue right there is just the privilege, right? That many of us have uh, that others don't have where we have a career, we have an education, we can choose kind of which route we want to take. And then there are those in our communities who don't have that privilege who don't have the, the background that we have to get to where they need to be for their own family survival. So that's one separate issue, right? The socioeconomical issue. The second issue is this, this fetish uh, of Asian American women, right? Mm -hmm. That just continues, I mean, over generations and over decades, just continues to be perpetuated. And that's the same narrative that's happening with the shooting, the shootings that happened in uh, Georgia as well as this continuous perpetuation that Asian women are in the sex industry and that, you know, and again, to Sherry's point earlier, there was a very targeted um, uh, type of business that then comes back to the Asian community and comes back to Asian women and how Asian women are perceived uh, in that light. Mm -hmm. It's just never ending. For all four of you, I just want to get a show of hands in the past year of the anti-Asian attacks on the elderly, of the mass shootings, how many of you are fearful for yourself or for your family? Just a show of hands. How many of you are angry as to what has happened to Asian Americans this past year? Sherry, your hand shot up, why? You know, it, it's, it's, it's angering because, you know, we've, experienced this throughout our lives, just the, the, the build up to this moment. We've actually, you know, had conversations a year ago at the start of the pandemic warning, you know, our communities that, you know, words matter and that's just the start. And it's kind of like that match that ignites this powder keg that has recently begun to explode. And, you know, it's, it's part of that, you know, feeling like you haven't been heard.
voice does matter. It fundamentally comes down to just right versus wrong. The youth in our communities have really been emboldened and empowered. This is the most aware in this time of our country. If we don't do it now, we will never learn these very hard lessons. All we need is love! We're the largest growing demographic in the country. And if we organize and we really call to strengthen our communities, many other communities are going to thrive as well. You know, I think at the end of the day, I do believe there's good in every single person. We can overcome this if people are willing to treat each other with human dignity. These attacks that we've seen on businesses and on Asian elders across the country have put our area universities on alert. Both Marquette and UW-Milwaukee say they take reports of bias incidents very seriously and there are consequences for those who violate the university's code of conduct. Even before the pandemic, UW-Milwaukee started developing more anti-biased and anti-racist training for students and staff that's rolled out on campus this spring. I checked in with Chia Vang. She's the interim chief diversity, equity and inclusion officer at UWS about the university's mission to build a more inclusive campus. We have to acknowledge that there's a lot of injustices that are taking place. Do you have hope that things will get better, that things can change? Hope is gives us the ability to continue to do better. We can overcome this if people are willing to, you know, to kind of treat each other with human dignity. Biases come when people think that they're better or others are less than. Well, the population of Asian students at Marquette has doubled in the last decade. In the last year, Marquette reported an uptick in the number of bias incidents reported, in particular reports related to social media since moving to virtual learning in light of the pandemic. Marquette leaders also released a statement condemning the shooting at three area spas in Georgia. That's where six of the victims were of Asian descent. It's provided some peace of mind for some Asian students on campus, but for Ning Ning Ni, a student from China and the president of the Chinese Culture and Charity Club on campus, she says the fear is always there. Sometimes I walk on the street, there are some people yelling at me. Your fear doesn't have anything to do with being Asian right now during a pandemic in the United States. Before the anti-Asia crisis, my fear has come from that um, I'm a female. And uh, after the kind of the crisis, my fear is from I am Asia and also am a female because I feel there are kind of like a lot of hatred that towards Asia. Well, that fear of not just the verbal attacks, but physical assaults has taken a toll on Asian Americans here in Southeast Wisconsin and around the country. For young people, it can have long lasting impacts. Here's what local mental health expert Dr. David Sonko says on what signs we should be looking out for. A more general sense of withdrawal, a uh, hobby that they typically would enjoy, or even sports that they might enjoy, uh, they might not want to participate. They'll, they'll typically lose interest in that. And also we might be able to see some physical symptoms as well. You know, decreased appetite, um, not wanting to eat, irregular sleep patterns, things like that, that kind of go beyond what would be quote unquote, normal teenage sleeping patterns. So then if you didn't deal with it, then what mm -hmm. happens? Well, unfortunately, what we see is that it will likely evolve into another form of uh, mental health pathology in later adult life. I mean, eventually what could be diagnosed as a clinical depression and also perhaps even a generalized anxiety in which uh, they may have worries about how they engage or even how they experience um, themselves in the context of a social group. On the silver screen, actor Mike Moe is probably better known as Bruce Lee in Quentin Tarantino's biopic, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But outside of Hollywood, he's a fifth degree black belt in Taekwondo and owns a martial arts studio in Wanakee. During this pandemic, he's made it his mission to teach kids self-confidence, self-worth, and self-love. Here's Sharon Bajenda. Kicks and punches are cool. Yeah. But what the world needs are positive people with inside strength that can actually make a difference. That's exactly what Mike Moe hopes to develop with the dozens of students he teaches at Moe's Martial Arts. The only thing that we can do to combat all the negative stuff is to continue to build our strength so we can send a light out. The Korean word Taekwondo literally translates to the way of the hand and foot. But at Moe's martial arts, classes are about 70% Taekwondo, and the rest involve challenges to instill confidence and help embrace differences and kindness. 
Every student's different, but at the end of the day, we're just trying to build their confidence up through martial arts. There, that was a punch that might work. Mo was born in Atlanta, but grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. It was pretty clear from the beginning that I was different. I, I always felt a sense of otherness. To combat those feelings, Mo said he turned to being the class clown and felt the need to do extra work to make sure people accepted and liked him at a young age. Things with the, the eyes and the things with the names and, and right away I, I figured out like, wow, there are some people that won't like me just because of the way I look. Growing up with immigrant parents also presented its own challenges with language barriers and cultural norms. Many of his friends had PB&J sandwiches for lunch while Mo... I would have seaweed and rice. So that was strange to others. But then I got some friends to try it and they're like, wow, this is good. So there, there's opportunities to show and, and help, help your community grow. Mo is a movie buff and looked up to Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee. He saw them as positive representations of Asian men as a kid and begged his mom to start Taekwondo at the age of 12. She said, no, 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 you got to practice your studies. I don't want you to get hurt. It's expensive, whatever it was. And then after a year, I just finally wore her down. <laughs> Not bad, Kato. Mo pursued entertainment and appeared alongside Brad Pitt in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, portraying Bruce Lee. I liked that he was cocky. I liked that he was brash, because that wasn't something that you would see an Asian male being. Mo's first movie set experience with another idol, Jackie Chan, also taught him lessons in humility. He was sharing food with us. He was sweeping the floor. And now, now do I look back and I say, that's not normal, you know, for somebody who's at a Jackie Chan level to do the things that he was doing shows extreme gratitude. Mo says many Asian males were stereotyped as being weak, submissive, and only falling into certain types of career paths. Looking back, he says he could have fallen into that had he not latched on to the love of martial arts. Now I have an opportunity to show other Asian American kids that might be in my school, hey, there's, there's many things that we can do. But more importantly, because we do live in more of a white dominant area, I can show all these other kids, hey, there's, there's a positive representation of an Asian male right here. And um, that's powerful for me now too. Now Mo's Martial Arts is using its platform to offer Zoom classes to AAPI kids all around the country who may not be able to afford classes. It's Mo's way of sharing how he built confidence. The importance of, of knowing people are rooting you on and lifting you up, there's something very powerful about that. His time in LA's entertainment industry continues into his classes today. Not every audition, not every competition, not every test is gonna go your way. So how do we respond to adversity? How can we build ourselves up from any failures or any shortcomings that we might go along the way and find success later. Mo says for kids, their general baseline is to love and accept. And as a husband and a father of three himself, he believes a little extra work in parenting will pay off. There are differences and it's okay to be different. That's gonna go a long way. Let's go three more. Mo says we can all coexist in a community. And at the end of the day, as Bruce Lee says, the function and duty of a quality human being is the sincere and honest development of potential and self-actualization. The more connections, strong connections we can make through respect and a common ground of love, we can, we can actually make a difference in our community. Well, as kids return to in-person activities like schools and summer camps and sports, as much as we prepare our kids, the unfortunate reality is that they will have their own experiences with anti-Asian hate within their lifetime that will widen our racial divide. So how can we as adults respond? Gelki Vang, she's an assistant director of a peer-run mental health respite in Wisconsin. She says meet kids where they are. I think it's acknowledging the feelings of being hurt. I think it is so easy for us as like parent as like older siblings or parents or guardians for us to like you want to save the day basically when really all the child wants is to be acknowledged and validated that those words hurt them that that experience really made them feel small and and you have to acknowledge that because they are human too and and it's not fair for people to for the people who are supposed to love you to just keep trying to save you when really they just 
when the child just deserves a moment to be sad. It's something that you definitely can relate to uh, based off of um, what you hear and, and what you see right now. After the break, sports and social activism have long gone hand in hand. We go one on one with Keston here of the Brewers, but first, as we had to break, a personal message from CBS 58 reporter Sharon Bagenda. Well, I've been so honored to be able to tell some of the stories of the people in the AAPI community here in our area. Now, you may have sensed a common theme in some of these stories, a sense of feeling otherness, a sense of feeling like they're different. And I can relate. I'm a proud Asian American, but I came from an immigrant family. I myself immigrated here with my family in 1999 to escape the persecution of Christians in Indonesia. It wasn't always easy being different, and it's still not easy now. So I encourage you for AAPI Heritage Month in May to embrace the cultures that we have here in Southeast Wisconsin. And with the heightened attacks of AAPI community members, if you see something, I encourage you, don't ignore it. Do something, stand up, say something, because this world would be a much better place if everybody just looked out for each other. Well, athletes and activism have long been a part of American and Olympic history, whether it was about race, gender, equal pay, or nationality. But for as long as it has been storied, athletes and sports teams voicing their opinions about these issues has been controversial. Since the start of the pandemic, a number of Asian American athletes have spoken out about the rise in anti-Asian attacks. Many are taking to social media, like tennis superstar Naomi Osaka, saying in part, it's really sad that stop Asian hate even has to be a hashtag. It should be common sense, but it seems like common sense is uncommon in this world now. Basketball player Jeremy Lind, he shocked the world when he shared he was called coronavirus on the court. And Olympic gold medalist Chloe Kim has admitted to getting hundreds of hateful messages a month, telling her to go back to China, even though she's a first-generation Korean American, and to stop taking away medals from white American girls on the team. Keston Hira of the Brewers now joins these athletes in using his platform to make a difference. When it happens to you know, people of your own race, it definitely kind of uh, changes your mindset a little bit and put the world in you know, a different perspective. Since the pandemic began, the rise in anti-Asian attacks has weighed heavily on Keston Hira of the Brewers. Know that you're going about your normal day and then um, something like that could happen uh, to not only anyone, but you know, especially right now with uh, a lot of the Asian hate going on, it's definitely scary. Of the more than 6,600 incidents of anti-Asian attacks recorded by the nonprofit Stop AAPI Hate from March of 2020 to March of 2021, many have been on Asian elders, leaving them severely hurt, some dying from their injuries. What actually does go through your head? That kind of makes you think about, you know, your, your grandparents or, you know, in their position, you know, are people going to try to take advantage of them or... Um, you know, treat them a certain way. It's something that you definitely can relate to. Hira grew up in California, a third generation Asian American and one of two players in the organization. He, like many, grew up a part of a culture that remained relatively quiet until now. We've grown up in these, these types of cultures or ways where it allows us to be thick skinned. And, you know, when people call us names or, you know, attack us for a race, we, we kind of just brush it off. We kind of just go about our business. And, and now it's like directly attacking, you know, Asian Americans. It's something that you really want to kind of take a stand. For us, it's, it's more than just speaking about the injustices. It is also being part of the solution. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Wisconsin athletes have recently led the way as social justice activists, with Bucks players taking to the streets in protest following the death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police. Our focus today cannot be on basketball. To forfeiting a playoff game in the wake of the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha. And after the shooting at three area spas in Georgia, where six of the eight victims killed were Asian women, the team released a statement saying in part, it's long past time for us to all join together to stop Asian hate. It fundamentally comes down to just right versus wrong. We want to be on the side of being right. Arvind Golpal Rutnam is the vice president of corporate social responsibility and the executive director of the Milwaukee Bucks Foundation. Why? Why as a Bucks organization, why do you feel the need to say something, to do something? Well, we believe it's our role as community members. The argument that people make that sports should just focus on the game, stay out of politics, stay out of social justice. What do you say to that? Politics, to sports, to entertainment, whatever it is, we're all interconnected so much more than we ever were. Those who question whether it's important to speak or stand or 
kneel or to stay in one specific lane. I think we're evolving as a society, right? And I think we need to set that example for the next generation that that's not a question of our athletes in those professions uh, going forward. It's an, it's an opportunity and it's a platform that we help support and enable versus question. Hira says he's leaned a lot on his family, and just like what's happened during the Black Lives Matter movement, he's also leaned on his teammates for support. What is your message to these people who, who think it's okay to attack elderly Asian people, who think it's okay to call us names, coronavirus, or tell us to go back to our own country? At the end of the day, it's just being about being a good person. And as more people from all races speak out about the rise in anti-Asian hate, Hira hopes people will listen. I'm definitely, you know, hopeful and, you know, pretty positive that things will change. And, uh, and I think, you know, we're taking the right initiative right now to, to make that step forward. The mass shooting in Georgia ignited a new generation of Asian Americans to take to the streets in protest and to voice their concerns both here in southeast Wisconsin and around the country. But does that mean we're any closer to change? Once again, here's Mainza Tao, Eric Kennedy, Pardeep Kalika, and Sherry Tran on our panel. Earlier I asked uh, a show of hands, how many of you are in fear because of what happened in the past year? All of you raised your hands. I asked you how many of you are angry? All of you have raised your hands. How many of you show of hands are hopeful that things can change? All four of you. Mine's out why? We are all at our most aware. This is the most aware in this time of our country. And this is where I do truly believe that change is going to happen. Unfortunately, you know, tragedy leads to change. And if we don't do it now, our, our children, our future generations, they will continue to get lost along the way. And we will never learn these very hard lessons. When we're dealing with a lot of this, you know, multi-generational racism that we experienced, it's, it's really perpetuated from like older generations. And as we see our society change, so then changes some of the, the attitudes or expectations that we have for what's okay. Um, and I think the, the youth in our communities have really been emboldened and empowered to, to speak out against what, what is wrong, you know, and speaking up for what's right. And, uh, and it's impressive, right? So that gives me a lot of hope um, that, you know, the work that we're doing is carrying on and it's going to continue. Uh, and that people are listening. I want to end this conversation with a question going around the room once again. Mm -hmm. For people, what we've seen in this past year is a lot of people stepping up outside of the Asian AAPI community, wanting to be allies. If there is one thing that you could say that people can do if they want to help, what would that be? Pardeep, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you, Pauline. I think, uh, again, just hope. Uh, courage, faith are the oxygen of human beings. There, we need it. Um, I think just have the courage to have those conversations. Courage to be curious, right? And not feel ashamed that, oh, I don't know anything about this community or that community. But to have the courage to be curious and then the courage to have those conversations that Pardeep talked about and the courage to also hold others accountable. Just having those healthy conversations. Uh, being able to be open and, and transparent. I think that continuing to respect one another, you may not have to be best friends with that person, but at, at, at the end of the day, you can come away with saying like, I respect you as a community member and going forward, I'm going to speak up when there's hatred or racism or, or violence uh, when it's happening to you or your community and vice versa. Sherry, you have the last word. Oh gosh, you know, it's everything that has been said has been phenomenal. I mean, it's really about, you know, when people tell you that something hurts them, you should believe them, right? Not try to justify or explain, but you know, but what about this? But what about that? It's, you know, somebody's sharing that they're hurting, uh, that's real for them. And you know, I think that's a big hurdle for folks to not like justify or try to explain, uh, you know, what, 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 what may have been happening, but just to listen to their stories and believe their stories. I think that's what we would want anyone to do for any of us, right? So many of you had said it starts with a conversation. And I wanna thank each and every one of you, Pardeep, Sherry, Mainza, Eric, thank you for joining in on this conversation, sharing your insight, no matter how tough it can be, but it starts with a conversation and I wanna thank you. I wanna leave you with some final thoughts now. To say this past year has been tough for Asian Americans would be an understatement. 
I would be lying if I said I wasn't looking over my shoulder more often wherever I go. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't afraid to go to places by myself, even in broad daylight. I would be lying because I truly am afraid. And it's not just fear for myself, but it's fear for my family and my friends, my elderly parents. They immigrated to the United States shortly after the Vietnam War for a better life for themselves, for my sister, for me, for their children, for their future grandchildren. No one, regardless of race, gender, or ethnicity, should have to live in fear or should have to endure such hate simply because of who they are. Our differences are what make us stronger. And when one person or one community hurts, we all hurt. These attacks did not need to happen, and they do not need to happen again in the future. So long as we show kindness, we have the willingness to learn and the openness to understand one another. That is how we thrive. We can do better. We need to do better. Thank you for watching this special edition of the CBS 58 Morning News, Asian in Wisconsin, Battling Bias in the Badger State.